We hope you will enjoy this audiobook from world-famous author Agatha Christie and the value and effort that we bring you these audiobooks of famous authors. Why not buy us a cup of coffee? Look for the link in the description below. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you will not miss another audio. Thank you for supporting this channel. It is appreciated. It was very awkward. Norton began babbling about bridge again. In the middle of it, a large wood pigeon came flapping over our heads and settled on the branch of a tree not far away. Colonel Luttrell picked up his gun. There's one of the blighters, he said. Before he could take aim, the bird had flown off again through the trees where it was impossible to get a shot at it. At the same moment, however, the colonel's attention was diverted by a movement on the far slope. Damn! There's a rabbit nibbling the bark of those young fruit trees. Thought I'd wired the place. He raised the rifle and fired. There was a scream in a woman's voice. It died in a kind of horrible gurgle. The rifle fell from the colonel's hands. His body sagged. He caught his lip. My God! It's Daisy! I was already running across the lawn. Norton came behind me. I reached the spot and knelt down. It was Mrs. Luttrell. She had been kneeling, tying a stake against one of the small fruit trees. The grass was long there so that I realized how it was that the colonel had not seen her clearly and had only distinguished movements in the grass. The light, too, was confusing. She had been shot through the shoulder, and the blood was gushing out. I bent to examine the wound and looked up at Norton. He was leaning against a tree and was looking green, and as though he were going to be sick, he said apologetically, I, uh, I can't stand blood. I said sharply, Get hold of Franklin at once, or the nurse. He nodded and ran off. It was Nurse Craven who appeared first upon the scene. She was there in an incredibly short time, and at once set about in a business-like way to stop the bleeding. Franklin arrived at a run soon afterwards. Between them they got her into the house and to bed. Franklin dressed and bandaged the wound, and sent for her own doctor, and Nurse Craven stayed with her. I ran across Franklin, just as he left the telephone. How is she? Oh, she'll pull through all right. It missed any vital spot, luckily. How did it happen? I told him. He said, I see. Where's the old boy? He'll be feeling knocked out, I shouldn't wonder. Probably needs attention more than she does. I shouldn't say his heart is any too good. We found Colonel Luttrell in the smoking room. He was a blue colour round the mouth and looked completely dazed. He said brokenly, Daisy, is she... How is she? Franklin said quickly, She'll be all right, sir. You needn't worry. I thought, rabbit, nibbling the bark. Don't know how I came to make such a mistake. Light in my eyes. These things happen, said Franklin dryly. I've seen one or two of them in my time. Look here, sir, you'd better let me give you a pick-me-up. You're not feeling too good. I I'm all right. Can I, can I go to her? Not just now. Nurse Craven is with her. But you don't need to worry. She's all right. Dr. Oliver will be here presently, and he'll tell you the same. I left the two of them together, and went out into the evening sunshine. Judith and Allerton were coming along the path towards me. His head was bent to hers, and they were both laughing. Coming on top of the tragedy that had just happened, it made me feel very angry. I called sharply to Judith, and she looked up, surprised. In a few words I told them what had occurred. What an extraordinary thing to happen, was my daughter's comment. She did not seem nearly as perturbed as she should have been, I thought. Allerton's manner was outrageous. He seemed to take the whole thing as a good joke. Serve the old Harrod and damn well right, he observed. Think the old boy did it on purpose? Certainly not, I said sharply. It was an accident. Yes, but I know these accidents. Damned convenient sometimes. My word, if the old boy shot her deliberately, I'd take my hat off to him. It was nothing of the kind. I said angrily. Don't be too sure. I've known two men who shot their wives. Cleaning his revolver was one. The other fired point blank at her as a joke, he said. Didn't know the thing was loaded. Got away with it, both of them. Damn good release, I should say myself. Colonel Luttrell, 
I said coldly. Isn't that type of man? <laughs> well, you couldn't say it wouldn't be a blessed release, could you? demanded Allerton pertinently. They hadn't just had a row or anything, had they? I turned away angrily, at the same time trying to hide a certain perturbation. Allerton had come a little too near the mark. For the first time a doubt crept into my mind. It was not bettered by meeting Boyd Carrington. He had been for a stroll down towards the lake, he explained. When I told him the news, he said at once, You don't think he meant to shoot her, do you, Hastings? My dear man, sorry, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. It was only for the moment, one wondered. She, she gave him a bit of provocation, you know. We were both silent for a moment, as we remembered the scene we had so unwillingly overheard. I went upstairs, feeling unhappy and worried, and rapped on Poirot's door. He had already heard through Curtis of what had occurred, but he was eager for full details. Since my arrival at Stiles, I had got into the way of reporting most of my daily encounters and conversations in full detail. In this way, I felt that the dear old fellow felt less cut off. It gave him the illusion of actually participating in everything that went on. I've always had a good and accurate memory, and found it a simple matter to repeat conversations verbatim. Poirot listened very attentively. I was hoping that he would be able definitely to poo-poo the dreadful suggestion that had by now taken easy control of my mind. But before he had a chance of telling me what he thought, there came a light tap on the door. It was Nurse Craven. She apologized for disturbing us. I'm sorry, but I thought the doctor was here. The old lady is conscious now, and she's worrying about her husband. She'd like to see him. Do you know where he is, Captain Hastings? I don't want to leave my patient. I volunteered to go and look for him. Poirot nodded approval, and Nurse Craven thanked me warmly. I found Colonel Luttrell in a little morning room that was seldom used. He was standing by the window looking out. He turned sharply as I came in. His eyes asked a question. He looked, I thought, afraid. Your wife is conscious, Colonel Luttrell, and is asking for you. Oh! The colour surged up in his cheeks, and I realised then how very white he had been before. He said slowly, fumbling like an old man, She, 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 she she's asking for me, I... I I'll, I'll, I'll come at once. He was so unsteady as he began shuffling towards the door that I came and helped him. He leaned on me heavily as we went up the stairs. His breathing was coming with difficulty. The shock, as Franklin had prophesied, was severe. We came to the door of the sick room. I tapped, and Nurse Craven's brisk, efficient voice called, Come in. Still supporting the old man, I went with him into the room. There was a screen round the bed. We came round the corner of it. Mrs. Luttrell was looking very ill, white and frail. Her eyes closed. She opened them as we came round the corner of the screen. She said in a small, breathless voice, George! George! Daisy! My dear! One of her arms was bandaged and supported. The other, the free one, moved unsteadily towards him. He took a step forward and clasped her frail little hand in his. He said again, Daisy! And then gruffly, Thank God you're all right. And looking up at him, seeing his eyes slightly misty and the deep love and anxiety in them, I felt bitterly ashamed of all our ghoulish imaginings. I crept quietly out of the room. Camouflaged accident, indeed. There was no disguising that heartfelt note of thankfulness. I felt immeasurably relieved. The sound of the gong startled me as I went along the passage. I had completely forgotten the passage of time. The accident had upset everything. Only the cook had gone on as usual and produced dinner at the usual time. Most of us had not changed, and Colonel Luttrell did not appear, but Mrs. Franklin, looking quite attractive in a pale pink evening dress, was downstairs for once and seemed in good health and spirits. Franklin, I thought, was moody and absorbed. After dinner, to my annoyance, Allerton and Judith disappeared into the garden together. I sat around a while, listening to Franklin and Norton discussing tropical diseases. Norton was a sympathetic and interested listener, even if he knew little of the subject under discussion. Mrs. Franklin and Boyd Carrington were talking at the other end of the room. He was showing her some patterns of curtains or cretons. Elizabeth Cole had a book and seemed deeply absorbed in it. I fancied that she was slightly embarrassed and ill at ease with me, perhaps not unnaturally so after the confidences of the afternoon. 
I was sorry about it all the same, and hoped she did not regret all she had told me. I should have liked to have made it clear to her that I should respect her confidence and not repeat it. However, she gave me no chance. After a while, I went up to Poirot. I found Colonel Luttrell, sitting in the circle of light thrown by one of the small electric lamps that was turned on. He was talking, and Poirot was listening. I think the Colonel was speaking to himself, rather than to his listener. I remember so well. Yes, it was at a hunt ball. She wore oh, oh, white stuff called a uh, tulle, I think it was. F floated all around her, such a pretty girl. Bowled me over then and there. I said to myself, that's the girl I'm going to marry. And by Jove, I brought it off. Awfully pretty way she had with her. Saucy, you know. Plenty of back chat. Always gave as good as she got, bless her. He chuckled. I saw the scene in my mind's eye. I could imagine Daisy Luttrell, with a young, saucy face and that smart tongue, so charming then, so apt to turn shrewish with the years. But it was as that young girl, his first real love, that Colonel Luttrell was thinking of her tonight. His Daisy. And again I felt ashamed of what we had said such a few hours previously. Of course, when Colonel Luttrell had at last taken himself off to bed, I blurted out the whole thing to Poirot. He listened very quietly. I could make nothing of the expression on his face. So, that is what you thought, Hastings, that the shot was fired on purpose? Yes, I feel ashamed now. Poirot waved aside my present feelings. Did the thought occur to you, of your own accord, or did someone else suggest it to you? Allerton said something of the kind, I said resentfully. He would, of course. Anyone else? Boyd Carrington suggested it. Ah, Boyd Carrington. And after all, he's a man of the world and has experience of these things. Ah, quite so, quite so. He did not see the thing happen, though. No, he'd gone for a walk. Bit of exercise before changing for dinner. I see. I said uneasily, I don't think I really believed that theory. It was only— Poirot interrupted me. You need not be so remorseful about your suspicions, Hastings. It was an idea quite likely to occur to anyone, given the circumstances. Oh, yes, it was all quite natural. There was something in Poirot's manner I did not quite understand. A reserve. His eyes were watching me with a curious expression. I said slowly, Perhaps, but seeing now how devoted he really is to her. Poirot nodded, Exactly. That is often the case, remember. Underneath the quarrels, the misunderstandings, the apparent hostility of everyday life, a real and true affection can exist. I agreed. I remembered the gentle, affectionate look in little Miss Luttrell's eyes as she looked up at her husband stooping over her bed. No more vinegar, no impatience, no ill temper. Married life, I mused as I went to bed, was a curious thing. That something in Poirot's manner still worried me. That curious, watchful look, as though he were waiting for me to see. What? I was just getting into bed when it came to me. Hit me, bang between the eyes. If Mrs. Luttrell had been killed, it would have been a case like those other cases. Colonel Luttrell would apparently have killed his wife. It would have been accounted an accident. Yet, at the same time, nobody would have been sure that it was an accident or whether it had been done on purpose. Insufficient evidence to show it as murder, but quite enough evidence for murder to be suspected. But that meant... That meant... What did it mean? It meant, if anything at all was to make sense, that it was not Colonel Luttrell who shot Mrs. Luttrell, but X. And that was clearly impossible. I had seen the whole thing. It was Colonel Luttrell who had fired the shot. No other shot had been fired. Unless... But surely that would be impossible. No, perhaps not impossible. Merely highly improbable. But possible, yes. Supposing that someone else had waited his moment, and at the exact instant when Colonel Luttrell had fired at a rabbit, this other person had fired at Mrs. Luttrell. Then only the one shot would have been heard, or even, with a slight discrepancy, it would have been put down as an echo. Now I come to think of it, there had been an echo, surely. Oh, but no, that was absurd. There were ways of deciding exactly what weapon a bullet had been fired from. The marks on the bullet must agree with the rifling of the barrel. 
But that, I remembered, was only when the police were anxious to establish what weapon had fired the shot. There would have been no inquiry in this business, for Colonel Luttrell would have been quite as certain as everyone else that it was he who fired the fatal shot. That fact would have been admitted, accepted without question. There would have been no question of tests. The only doubt would have been whether the shot was fired accidentally or with criminal intent, a question that could never be resolved. And therefore the case fell into line exactly with those other cases, with the case of the labourer Riggs, who didn't remember but supposed he must have done it, with Maggie Litchfield, who went out of her mind and gave herself up for a crime she had not committed. Yes, this case fell into line with the rest, and I knew now the meaning of Poirot's manner. He was waiting for me to appreciate the fact. Chapter 10 I opened the subject with Poirot the following morning. His face lighted up, and he wagged his head appreciatively. Excellent, Hastings. I wondered if you would see the similarity. I did not want to prompt you, you understand. Then I'm right. This is another X case, undeniably. But why, Poirot? What is the motive? Poirot shook his head. Don't you know? Haven't you any idea? Poirot said slowly, I have an idea, yes. You've got the connection between all these different cases. I think so. Well, then? I could hardly restrain my impatience. No, Hastings. But I've got to know. It is much better that you should not. Why? You must take it from me that it is so. You are incorrigible, I said, twisted up with arthritis, sitting there helpless, and still trying to play a lone hand. Do not figure to yourself that I am playing a lone hand, not at all. You are, on the contrary, very much in the picture, Hastings. You are my eyes and ears. I only refuse to give you information that might be dangerous. To me, to the murderer. You want him, I said slowly, not to suspect that you were on his track. That is it, I suppose. Or else you think that I cannot take care of myself. You should at least know one thing, Hastings. A man who has killed once will kill again and again and again. At any rate, I said grimly, there hasn't been another murder this time. One bullet at least has gone wide. Yes, that was very fortunate, very fortunate indeed. As I told you, these things are difficult to foresee. He sighed. His face took on a worried expression. I went away quietly, realizing sadly how unfit Poirot was now for any sustained effort. His brain was still keen, but he was a sick and tired man. Poirot had warned me not to try to penetrate the personality of X. In my own mind, I still clung to my belief that I had penetrated that personality. There was only one person at Stiles who struck me as definitely evil. By a simple question, however, I could make sure of one thing. The test would be a negative one, but would nevertheless have a certain value. I tackled Judith after breakfast. Where had you been yesterday evening when I met you? You and Major Allerton. The trouble is that when you are intent on one aspect of a thing, you tend to ignore all other aspects. I was quite startled when Judith flared out at me. Really, father, I don't see what business it is of yours. I stared at her, rather taken aback. I... I only asked. Yes, but why? Why do you have to be continually asking questions? What was I doing? Where did I go? Who was I with? It's really intolerable. The funny part of it was, of course, that this time I was not really asking at all where Judith was. It was Allerton I was interested in. I tried to pacify her. <laughs> really, Judith, I don't see why I can't ask a simple question. I don't see why you want to know. I don't particularly. I mean, I just wondered why neither of you, uh, seemed to know what had happened. Oh, about the accident, you mean? I'd been down to the village, if you must know, to get some stamps. I pounced on the personal pronoun. Allerton wasn't with you, then? Judith gave an exaggerated gasp. No, he was not, she said in tones of cold fury. Actually, we'd met just near the house, and only about two minutes before we met you. I hope you're satisfied now. But I'd just like to say that if I'd spent a whole day walking around with Major Allerton, it's really not your business. I'm twenty-one and earning my own living, and how I spend my time is entirely my own business. Entirely, I said, quickly trying to stem the tide. I'm glad you agree. Judith looked mollified. She gave a rueful half-smile. Oh, dearest, do try not to come the heavy father quite so much. You don't know how maddening it is. If you just wouldn't fuss so. I won't, 
I really won't in future, I promised her. Franklin came striding along at this minute. Hello, Judith. Come along. We're later than usual. His manner was curt and really hardly polite. In spite of myself, I felt annoyed. I knew that Franklin was Judith's employer, that he had a call upon her time, and that since he paid for it, he was entitled to give her orders. Nevertheless, I did not see why he could not behave with common courtesy. His manners were not what one would call polished to anyone, but he did at least behave to most people with a certain amount of everyday politeness. But to Judith, especially of late, his manner was always curt and dictatorial in the extreme. He hardly looked at her when he spoke, and merely barked out orders. Judith never appeared to resent this, but I did on her behalf. It crossed my mind that it was especially unfortunate, since it contrasted in such a very marked way with Allerton's exaggerated attention. No doubt John Franklin was a ten times better man than Allerton, but he compared very badly with him from the point of view of attraction. I watched Franklin as he strode along the path towards the laboratory. His ungainly walk, his angular build, the jutting bones of his face and head, his red hair and his freckles, an ugly man and an ungainly man. None of the more obvious qualities. A good brain, yes, but women seldom fall for brains alone. I reflected with dismay that Judith, owing to the circumstances of her job, practically never came into contact with other men. She had no opportunity of sizing up various attractive men. Compared with the gruff and unattractive Franklin, Allerton's meretricious charm stood out with all the force of contrast. My poor girl had no chance of appraising him at his true worth. Supposing that she should come seriously to lose her heart to him. The irritability she had shown just now was a disquieting sign. Allerton, I knew, was a real bad lot. He was possibly something more. If Allerton were X, he could be. At the time that the shot was fired, he had not been with Judith. But what was the motive of all these seemingly purposeless crimes? There was, I felt sure, nothing of the madman about Allerton— he was sane, altogether sane, and utterly unprincipled. And Judith, my Judith, was seeing altogether too much of him. Up to this time, though I had been faintly worried about my daughter, my preoccupation over X and the possibility of a crime occurring at any moment had successfully driven more personal problems to the back of my mind. Now that the blow had fallen, that a crime had been attempted and had mercifully failed, I was free to reflect on these things— and the more I did so, the more anxious I became. A chance word spoken one day revealed to me the fact that Allerton was a married man. Boyd Carrington, who knew all about everyone, enlightened me further. Allerton's wife was a devout Roman Catholic. She had left him a short time after their marriage. Owing to her religion, there had never been any question of divorce. "'And if you ask me,' said Boyd Carrington, frankly, "'it suits the blighter down to the ground. "'His intentions are always dishonourable, "'and a wife in the background suits the book very well. "'Pleasant hearing for a father.' "'The days after the shooting accident "'passed uneventfully enough on the surface, "'but they accompanied a growing undercurrent of unrest on my part. "'Colonel Luttrell spent much time in his wife's bedroom.' A nurse had arrived to take charge of the patient, and Nurse Craven was able to resume her ministrations to Mrs. Franklin. Without wishing to be ill-natured, I must admit that I had observed signs on Mrs. Franklin's part of irritation at not being the invalid en chef. The fuss and attention that centred around Mrs. Luttrell was clearly very displeasing to the little lady who was accustomed to her own health being the main topic of the day. She lay about in a hammock chair, her hand to her side, complaining of palpitation— no food that was served was suitable for her, and all her exactions were masked by a veneer of patient endurance. "'I do so hate making a fuss,' she murmured plaintively to Poirot. "'I feel so ashamed of my wretched health. It's so, so humiliating, always having to ask people to be doing things for me. I sometimes think ill health really is a crime. If one isn't healthy and insensitive, one isn't fit for this world, and one should just be put quietly away.' "'Ah, no, madame!' Poirot, as always, was gallant. The delicate, exotic flower has to have the shelter of the greenhouse. It cannot endure the cold winds. It is the common weed that thrives in the wintry air, but it is not to be prized higher on that account. Consider my case. Cramped, twisted, unable to move, but I, I do not think of quitting life. I enjoy still what I can. The food, the drink, the pleasures of the intellect— Mrs. Franklin sighed and murmured, 
Ah, but it's different for you. You have no one but yourself to consider. In my case there is my poor John. I feel acutely what a burden I am to him. A sickly, useless wife, a millstone hung round his neck. He has never said that to you, I'm sure. Oh, not said so, of course, but men are so transparent, poor dears, and John isn't any good at concealing his feelings. He doesn't mean, of course, to be unkind, but he's, well, mercifully for himself, he is a very insensitive sort of person. He's no feelings, and so he doesn't expect anyone else to have them. It's so terribly lucky to be born thick-skinned. I should not describe Dr. Franklin as thick-skinned, wouldn't you? Oh, but you don't know him as well as I do. Of course, I know that if it wasn't for me, he would be much freer. Sometimes, you know, I get so terribly depressed that I think what a relief it would be to end it all. Oh, come, madame. After all, what use am I to anybody? To go out of it all into the great unknown, she shook her head. And then John would be free. Great fiddlesticks, said Nurse Craven, when I repeated this conversation to her. She won't do anything of the kind. Don't you worry, Captain Hastings. These ones that talk about ending it all in a dying, dark voice haven't the faintest intention of doing anything of the kind. And I must say that once the excitement aroused by Mrs. Luttrell's injury had died down and Nurse Craven was once more in attendance, Mrs. Franklin's spirits improved very much. On a particularly fine morning, Curtis had taken Poirot down to the corner below the beech trees near the laboratory. This was a favourite spot of his— it was sheltered from any east wind, and in fact hardly any breeze could ever be felt there. This suited Poirot, who abhorred draughts, and was always suspicious of the fresh air. Actually, I think he much preferred to be indoors, but had grown to tolerate the outer air when muffled in rugs. I strolled down to join him, and as I got there, Mrs. Franklin came out of the laboratory. She was most becomingly dressed, and looked remarkably cheerful. She explained that she was driving over with Boyd Carrington to see the house and give expert advice in choosing cretons. I left my handbag in the lab yesterday when I was talking to John, she explained. Poor John. He and Judith have driven to Tadcaster. They were short of some chemical reagent or other. She sank down on a seat near Poirot and shook her head with a comical expression. Poor dear. I'm so glad I haven't got the scientific mind. On a lovely day like this it all seems so puerile. You must not let scientists hear you say that, madame. No, of course not. Her face changed. It grew serious. She said quietly, You mustn't think, Monsieur Poirot, that I don't admire my husband. I do. I think the way he just lives for his work is really tremendous. There was a little tremor in her voice. A suspicion crossed my mind that Mrs. Franklin rather liked playing different roles. At this moment she was being the loyal and hero-worshipping wife. She leaned forward, placing an earnest hand on Poirot's knee. John, she said, is really a, a kind of saint. It makes me quite frightened sometimes. To call Franklin a saint was somewhat overstating the case, I thought. But Barbara Franklin went on, her eyes shining. He'll do anything, take any risk, just to advance the sum of human knowledge. That is pretty fine, don't you think? Assuredly, assuredly, said Poirot quickly. But sometimes, you know went on Mrs. Franklin. I'm really nervous about him. The lengths to which he'll go, I mean. This horrible bean thing he's experimenting with now. I'm so afraid he'll start experimenting on himself. He'd take every precaution, surely, I said. She shook her head with a slightly rueful smile. You don't know John. Did you never hear about what he did with that new gas? I shook my head. It was some new gas they wanted to find out about. John volunteered to test it. He was shut up in a tank for something like thirty-six hours, taking his pulse and temperature and respiration to see what the after-effects were, and if they were the same for men as for animals. It was a frightful risk. So one of the professors told me afterwards he might easily have passed out altogether. But that's the sort of person John is, absolutely oblivious of his own safety. I think it's rather wonderful, don't you, to be like that? I should never be brave enough. It needs, indeed, the high courage, said Poirot to do these things in cold blood. Barbara Franklin said, Yes, it does. I'm awfully proud of him, you know. But at the same time, it makes me rather nervous, too. Because, you see, guinea pigs and frogs are no good after a certain point. You want the human reaction. That's why I feel so terrified that John will go and dose himself with this nasty ordeal bean, and that something awful might happen. She sighed and shook her head. But he only laughs at my fears. 
He really is a sort of saint, you know. At this moment, Boyd Carrington came towards us. Hello, Babs. Ready? Yes, Bill. Waiting for you. I do hope it won't tire you too much. Of course it won't. I feel better today than I have for ages. She got up, smiled prettily at us both, and walked up the lawn with her tall escort. Dr. Franklin, the modern saint. Hm, said Poirot. Rather a change of attitude, I said. But I think the lady is like that. Like what? Given to dramatizing herself in various roles. One day the misunderstood, neglected wife, then the self-sacrificing, suffering woman who hates to be a burden on the man she loves. Today it's the hero-worshipping helpmate. The trouble is that all the roles are slightly overdone. Poirot said thoughtfully, You think Mrs. Franklin do you not uh, rather a fool? Well, I wouldn't say that. Yes, perhaps not a very brilliant intellect. Ah, she is not your type. Who is my type? I snapped. Poirot replied unexpectedly, Open your mouth and shut your eyes and see what the fairies will send you. I was prevented from replying because Nurse Craven came tripping hastily across the grass. She gave us a smile with a brilliant flash of teeth, unlocked the door of the lab, pushed inside, and reappeared with a pair of gloves. First a hanky, and now gloves, always something left behind, she observed, as she sped back with them to where Barbara Franklin and Boyd Carrington were waiting. Mrs. Franklin, I reflected, was that rather feckless type of woman who always did leave things behind, shedding her possessions and expecting everybody to retrieve them as a matter of course, and even, I fancied, was rather proud of herself for doing so. I had heard her more than once murmur complacently, Of course, I've got a head like a sieve. I sat looking after Nurse Craven as she ran across the lawn and out of sight. She ran well. Her body was vigorous and well-balanced. I said impulsively, I should think a girl must get fed up with that sort of life. I mean, when there isn't much nursing to be done, when it's just fetch and carry. I don't suppose Mrs. Franklin is particularly considerate or kindly. Poirot's response was distinctly annoying. For no reason whatever, he closed his eyes and murmured, Auburn hair. Undoubtedly, Nurse Craven had got auburn hair, but I did not see why Poirot should choose just this minute to comment upon it. I made no reply. Chapter 11 It was, I think, on the following morning before lunch that a conversation took place which left me vaguely disquieted. There were four of us, Judith, myself, Boyd Carrington, and Norton. Exactly how the subject started, I'm not sure, but we were talking of euthanasia, the case for and against it. Boyd Carrington, as was natural, did most of the talking, Norton putting in a word or two here and there, and Judith sitting silently but closely attentive. I myself had confessed that though there seemed on the face of it every reason to support the practice, yet in actuality I felt a sentimental shrinking from it. Besides, I said, I thought it would put too much power in the hands of relatives. Norton agreed with me. He added that he thought it should only be done by the wish and consent of the patient himself, where death after prolonged suffering was certain. Boyd Carrington said, Ah, but that's the curious thing. Does the person most concerned ever wish to put himself out of his misery, as we say? He then told a story, which he said was authentic, of a man in terrible pain from inoperable cancer. This man had begged the doctor in attendance to give him something that would finish it all. The doctor had replied, I can't do that, old man. Later, on leaving, he had placed by the patient some morphia tablets, telling him carefully how many he could safely take, and what dose would be dangerous. Although these were left in the patient's charge, and he could easily have taken a fatal quantity, he did not do so. Thus proving, said Boyd Carrington, that in spite of his words, the man preferred his suffering to a swift and merciful release. It was then that Judith spoke for the first time, spoke with vigour and abruptly. Of course he would, she said. It shouldn't have been left to him to decide. Boyd Carrington asked what she meant. I mean that anyone who's weak, in pain and ill, hasn't got the strength to make a decision. They can't. It must be done for them. It's the duty of someone who loves them to take the decision. Duty? I queried abruptly. Judith turned on me. Yes, duty. Someone whose mind is clear, and who will take the responsibility. Boyd Carrington shook his head. And end up in the dock charged with murder? Not necessarily. Anyway, if you love someone, you would take the risk. But, but, but look here, Judith, said Norton, 
what you're suggesting is a simply terrific responsibility to take. I don't think it is. People are too afraid of responsibility. They'll take responsibility where a dog is concerned. Why not with a human being? Well, it's rather different, isn't it? Judith said, Yes, it's more important. Norton murmured, You take my breath away. Boyd Carrington asked curiously, So you'd take the risk, would you? I think so. I'm not afraid of taking risks. Boyd Carrington shook his head. It wouldn't do, you know. You can't have people here, there, and everywhere taking the law into their own hands, deciding matters of life and death. Norton said, Actually, you know, Boyd Carrington, most people wouldn't have the nerve to take the responsibility. He smiled faintly as he looked at Judith. Don't believe you would if it came to the point. Judith said composedly, One can't be sure, of course. I think I should. Norton said with a slight twinkle, Not unless you had an axe of your own to grind. Judith flushed hotly. She said sharply, That just shows you don't understand at all. If I had a, a personal motive, I couldn't do anything. Don't you see? She appealed to us all. It's got to be absolutely impersonal. You could only take the responsibility of, of ending a life if you were quite sure of your motive. It must be absolutely selfless. All the same, said Norton, you wouldn't do it. Judith insisted, I would. To begin with, I don't hold life as sacred as all you people do. Unfit lives, useless lives, they should be got out of the way. There's so much mess about. Only people who can make a decent contribution to the community ought to be allowed to live. The others ought to be put painlessly away. She appealed suddenly to Boyd Carrington. You agree with me, don't you? He said slowly, In principle, yes. Only the worthwhile should survive. Wouldn't you take the law into your own hands if it was necessary? Boyd Carrington said slowly, oh, Perhaps. I don't know. Norton said quietly, A lot of people would agree with you in theory, but practice is a different matter. That's not logical. Norton said impatiently, Of course it's not. It's really a question of courage. One just hasn't got the guts, to put it vulgarly. Judith was silent. Norton went on, Frankly, you know, Judith, you'd be just the same yourself. You wouldn't have the courage when it came to it. Don't you think so? I'm sure of it. I think you're wrong, Norton, said Boyd Carrington. I think Judith has any amount of courage. Fortunately, the issue doesn't present itself. The gong sounded from the house. Judith got up. She said very distinctly to Norton, You're wrong, you know. I've got more... more guts than you think. She went swiftly towards the house. Boyd Carrington followed her, saying, Hey, wait for me, Judith. I followed, feeling for some reason rather dismayed. Norton, who was always quick to sense a mood, endeavoured to console me. <laughs> she doesn't mean it, you know, he said. It's the sort of half-baked idea one has when one is young. But fortunately one doesn't carry it out. It remains just talk. I think Judith overheard, for she cast a furious glance over her shoulder. Norton dropped his voice. Theories needn't worry anybody, he said. But look here, Hastings. Yes? Norton seemed rather embarrassed. He said, I don't want to butt in, but what do you know of Allerton? Of Allerton? Yes. Sorry if I'm being a nosy Parker, but frankly, if I were you, I shouldn't let that girl of yours see too much of him. He's, well, he, his reputation isn't very good. I can see for myself the sort of rotter he is, I said bitterly, but it's not so easy in these days. Oh, I know. Girls can look after themselves, as the saying goes. Most of them can, too, but, well, Allerton has rather a special technique in that line. He hesitated, then said, Look here, I, I feel I ought to tell you. Don't let it go farther, of course, but I do happen to know something pretty foul about him. He told it me then and there, and I was able to verify it in every detail. It was a revolting tale. The story of a girl, sure of herself, modern, independent. Allerton had brought all his technique to bear upon her. Later had come the other side of the picture. The story ended with a desperate girl taking her own life, with an overdose of Veronal. 
and the horrible part was that the girl in question had been much the same type as Judith, the independent, highbrow kind, the kind of girl who, when she does lose her heart, loses it with a desperation and an abandonment that the silly little fluffy type can never know. I went into lunch with a horrible sense of foreboding. Chapter 12 is uh, anything worrying you, mon ami? asked Poirot that afternoon. I did not answer him, merely shook my head. I felt that I had no right to burden Poirot with this, my purely personal problem. It was not as though he could help in any way. Judith would have treated any remonstrances on his part with the smiling detachment of the young towards the boring counsels of the old. Judith. My Judith. It is hard now to describe just what I went through that day. Afterwards, thinking it over, I am inclined to put something down to the atmosphere of styles itself. Evil imaginings came easily to the mind there. There was, too, not only the past, but a sinister present. The shadow of murder and a murderer haunted the house. And to the best of my belief, the murderer was Allerton, and Judith was losing her heart to him. It was unbelievable, monstrous, and I didn't know what to do. It was after lunch that Boyd Carrington drew me aside. He hemmed and hawed a bit before coming to the point. At last he said rather jerkily, <clears throat> Don't think I'm interfering, but I think you ought to speak to that girl of yours. Give her a word of warning, eh? You know this fellow, Allerton. Reputation's pretty bad, and she, well, it looks rather like a case. So easy for these men without children to speak like that. Give her a word of warning? Would it be any use? Would it make things worse? If only Cinders were here, she would know what to do, what to say. I was tempted, I admit, to hold my peace and say nothing, but I reflected after a while that this was really only cowardice. I shrank from the unpleasantness of having things out with Judith. I was, you see, afraid of my tall, beautiful daughter. I paced up and down the gardens in increasing agitation of mind. My footsteps led me at last to the rose garden and there, as it were, the decision was taken out of my hands, for Judith was sitting on a seat alone. And in all my life I have never seen an expression of greater unhappiness on any woman's face. The mask was off. Indecision and deep unhappiness showed only too plainly. I took my courage in my hands. I went to her. She did not hear me until I was beside her. Judith, I said, for God's sake, Judith, don't mind so much. She turned on me, startled. Father, I, I didn't hear you. I went on, knowing that it would be fatal if she managed to turn me back to normal everyday conversation. Oh, my dearest child, don't think I don't know that I can't see. He isn't worth it. Oh, do believe me, he isn't worth it. Her face, troubled, alarmed, was turned towards me. She said quietly, Do you think— that you really know what you're talking about. I do know. You care about this man, but, my dear, it's no good. She smiled somberly, a heartbreaking smile. Perhaps I know that as well as you do. You don't. You can't. Oh, Judith, what can come of it all? He's a married man. There can be no future there for you, only sorrow and shame and all ending in bitter self-loathing. Her smile grew wider even more sorrowful. How fluently you talk, don't you? Give it up, Judith. Give it all up. No. He's not worth it, my dear. She said very quietly and slowly, He's worth everything in the world to me. No. No, Judith, I beg of you. The smile vanished. She turned on me like an avenging fury. How dare you! How dare you interfere! I won't stand it! You are never to speak to me of this again! I hate you! I hate you! It's no business of yours! It's my life! My own secret inside life! She got up. With one firm hand, she pushed me aside and went past me, like an avenging fury. I stared after her, dismayed. I was still there, dazed and helpless, unable to think out my next course of action some quarter of an hour later. I was there when Elizabeth Cole and Norton found me. They were, I realized later, very kind to me. They saw, they must have seen, that I was in a state of great mental perturbation. 
but tactfully enough they made no slightest allusion to my state of mind. Instead they took me with them on a rambling walk. They were both nature lovers. Elizabeth Cole pointed out wild flowers to me. Norton showed me birds through his field glasses. Their talk was gentle, soothing, concerned only with feathered beings and with woodland flora. Little by little I came back to normal, although underneath I was still in a state of the utmost perturbation. Moreover, I was, as people are, convinced that any happening that occurred was connected with my own particular perplexity. So therefore, when Norton, his glasses to his eyes, exclaimed, "'Hello! If that isn't a speckled woodpecker! I never—' and then broke off suddenly. I immediately leapt to suspicion. I held out my hand for the glasses. Let me see. My voice was peremptory. Norton fumbled with the glasses. He said in a curious, hesitating voice, I... I... I made a mistake. It, it's flown away. At least, as a matter of fact, it, it, it was quite a common bird. His face was white and troubled. He avoided looking at us. He seemed both bewildered and distressed. Even now I cannot think I was altogether unreasonable in jumping to the conclusion that he had seen through those glasses of his something that he was determined to prevent my seeing. Whatever it was that he had seen, he was so thoroughly taken aback by it that it was noticeable to both of us. His glasses had been trained on a distant belt of woodland. What had he seen there? I said peremptorily, Let me look. I snatched at the glasses. I remember he tried to defend them from me but he did it clumsily. I seized them roughly. Norton said weakly, It wasn't really. I mean, uh, the bird's gone, I wish. My hands shaking a little, I adjusted the glasses to my eyes. They were powerful glasses. I trained them as nearly as I could on the spot where I thought Norton had been looking. But I saw nothing. Nothing but a gleam of white, a girl's white dress, disappearing into the trees. I lowered the glasses. Without a word, I handed them back to Norton. He did not meet my eyes. He was looking worried and perplexed. We walked back to the house together, and I remember that Norton was very silent all the way. Mrs. Franklin and Boyd Carrington came in shortly after we got back to the house. He had taken her in his car to Tadcaster, because she wanted to do some shopping. She had done it, I gather, pretty thoroughly. Lots of parcels came out of the car, and she was looking quite animated, talking and laughing, and with quite a colour in her cheeks. She sent Boyd Carrington up with a particularly fragile purchase, and I gallantly received a further consignment. Her talk was quicker and more nervous than usual. Frightfully hot, isn't it? I think there's going to be a storm. This weather must break soon. They say, you know, there's quite a water shortage. The worst drought there's been for years. She went on, turning to Elizabeth Cole. What have you all been doing with yourselves? Where's John? He said he'd got a headache, and he was going to walk it off. Very unlike him to have a headache. I think you know he's worried about his experiments. They aren't going right or something. I wish he'd talk more about things. She paused and then addressed Norton. You're very silent, Mr. Norton. Is anything the matter? You look... Well, you look scared. You haven't seen the ghost of old Mrs. Whoever it was? Norton started. Uh, uh, no. No, I... I haven't seen any ghost. I... I, I was just thinking of something. It was at that moment that Curtis came through the doorway, wheeling Poirot in his invalid chair. He stopped with it in the hall, preparatory to taking his master out and carrying him up the stairs. Poirot, his eyes suddenly alert, looked from one to the other of us. He said sharply, "'What is it? Is anything the matter?' None of us answered for a minute. Then Barbara Franklin said with a little artificial laugh, "'No, of course not. What should be the matter?' It's just, uh, perhaps, thunder coming? I, uh, oh dear, I'm, I, I, I'm terribly tired. Bring those things up, will you, Captain Hastings? Thank you so much. I followed her up the stairs and along the east wing. Her room was the end one on that side. Mrs. Franklin opened the door. I was behind her, my arms full of parcels. She stopped abruptly in the doorway. By the window, Boyd Carrington was having his palm examined by Nurse Craven. He looked up and laughed a little sheepishly. Hello, I'm having my fortune told. Nurse is no end of a hand reader. Really? I had no idea of that. Barbara Franklin's voice was sharp. I had an idea that she was annoyed with Nurse Craven. Please take these things, Nurse, will you? And you might make me an egg flip. I feel very tired. A hot water bottle, too, please. I'll get to bed as soon as possible. Certainly, Mrs. Franklin. 
Nurse Craven moved forward. She showed no signs of anything but professional concern. Mrs. Franklin said, oh, Please go, Bill. I'm terribly tired. Boyd Carrington looked very concerned. Oh, I say, Babs, has it been too much for you? I am sorry. What a thoughtless fool I am. I shouldn't have let you overtire yourself. Mrs. Franklin gave him her angelic martyr's smile. I didn't want to say anything. I do hate being tiresome. We two men went out of the room, somewhat abashed, and left the two women together. Boyd Carrington said contritely, What a damn fool I am! Barbara seemed so bright and gay, I forgot all about tiring her. Hope she's not knocked herself up. I said mechanically, Oh, I expect she'll be all right after a night's rest. He went down the stairs. I hesitated, and then went along the other wing towards my own room, and Poirot's. The little man would be expecting me. For the first time I was reluctant to go to him. I had so much to occupy my thoughts, and I still had that dull, sick feeling at the pit of my stomach. I went slowly along the corridor. From inside Allerton's room I heard voices. I don't think I meant consciously to listen, though I stopped for a minute automatically outside his door. Then, suddenly, the door opened, and my daughter Judith came out. She stopped dead when she saw me. I caught her by the arm and hustled her along into my room. I was suddenly immensely angry. What do you mean by going to that fellow's room? She looked at me steadily. She showed no anger now, only complete coldness. For some few seconds she did not reply. I shook her by the arm. I won't have it, I tell you. You don't know what you're doing. She said then in a low, biting voice. I think you have a perfectly filthy mind. I said, I dare say I have. It's a reproach your generation is fond of levelling at mine. We have at least certain standards. Understand this, Judith. I forbid you absolutely to have anything more to do with that man. She looked at me steadily. Then she said quietly, I see. So that's it. Do you deny that you're in love with him? No. But you don't know what he is. You, you can't know. Deliberately, without mincing my language, I repeated to her the story I had heard about Allerton. You see, I said when I had finished, that's the kind of foul brute he is. She seemed quite annoyed, her lips curled upward scornfully. I never thought he was a saint, I can assure you. Doesn't this make any difference to you? Judith, you can't be utterly depraved. Call it that if you like. Judith, you haven't... You aren't... I could not put my meaning into words. She shook her arm free from my detaining hand. Now listen, father. I do what I choose. You can't bully me, and it's no good ranting. I shall do exactly as I please with my life, and you can't stop me. In another instant she was out of the room. I found my knees trembling. I sank down onto a chair. It was worse, much worse than I thought. The child was utterly infatuated. There was no one to whom I could appeal. Her mother, the only person she might have listened to, was dead. It all depended on me. I do not think that either before or since I have ever suffered as I suffered then. Presently I roused myself. I washed and shaved and changed. I went down to dinner. I behaved, I fancy, in quite a normal manner. Nobody seemed to notice anything amiss. Once or twice I saw Judith flash a curious glance at me. She must have been puzzled, I think, by the way I was able to appear quite like my usual self. And all the time, underneath, I was growing more and more determined. All that I needed was courage. Courage and brains. After dinner we went outside, looked up at the sky, commented on the closeness of the atmosphere, prophesied rain, thunder, a storm. Out of the tail of my eye I saw Judith disappear round the corner of the house. Presently Allerton strolled in the same direction. I finished what I was saying to Boyd Carrington, and wandered that way myself. Norton, I think, tried to stop me. He took my arm. He tried, I think, to suggest walking up to the rose garden. I took no notice. He was still with me as I turned the corner of the house. They were there. I saw Judith's upturned face saw Allerton's bent down over it, saw how he took her in his arms, and the kiss that followed. Then they broke away quickly. I took a step forward. Almost by main force, Norton hauled me back and round the corner. He said, Look here, you can't— I interrupted him. I said forcefully, I can, and I will. 
It's no good, my dear fellow. It's all very distressing, but all it comes to is that there's nothing you can do. I was silent. He might think that that was so, but I knew better. Norton went on. I know how ineffectual and, and maddened one feels, but the only thing to do is to admit defeat. Accept it, man. I didn't contradict him. I waited, allowing him to talk. Then I went firmly round the corner of the house again. The two of them had disappeared now, but I had a shrewd idea of where they might be. There was a summer house concealed in a grove of lilac trees not far away. I went towards it. I think Norton was still with me, but I'm not sure. As I got nearer, I heard voices and stopped. It was Allerton's voice I heard. Well then, my dear girl, that's settled. Don't make any more objections. You go up to town tomorrow. I'll say I'm running over to Ipswich to stay with a pal for a night or two. You wire from London that you can't get back. And who's to know of that charming little dinner at my flat? You won't regret it. I can promise you. I felt Norton tugging at me, and suddenly, meekly, I turned. I almost laughed at the sight of his worried, anxious face. I let him drag me back to the house. I pretended to give in because I knew, at that moment, exactly what I was going to do. I said to him, clearly and distinctly, Don't worry, old chap. <laughs> it's all no good. I see that now. You can't control your children's lives. I'm through. He was ridiculously relieved. Shortly afterwards, I told him I was going to bed early. I've got a bit of a headache, I said. He had no suspicions at all of what I was going to do. I paused for a moment in the corridor. It was quite quiet. There was no one about. The beds had all been turned down, ready for the night. Norton, who had a room on this side, I had left downstairs. Elizabeth Cole was playing bridge. Curtis, I knew, would be downstairs having his supper. I had the place to myself. I flatter myself that I have not worked with Poirot for so many years in vain. I knew just what precautions to take. Allerton was not going to meet Judith in London tomorrow. Allerton was not going anywhere tomorrow. The whole thing was so ridiculously simple. I went to my own room and picked up my bottle of aspirins. Then I went into Allerton's room and into the bathroom. The tablets of Slumberill were in the cupboard. Eight, I considered, ought to do the trick. One or two was the stated dose. Eight, therefore, ought to be ample. Allerton himself had said the toxic dose was not high. I read the label. It is dangerous to exceed the prescribed dose. I smiled to myself. I wrapped a silk handkerchief round my hand and unscrewed the bottle carefully. There must be no fingerprints on it. I emptied out the tablets. Yes, they were almost exactly the same size as the aspirins. I put eight aspirins in the bottle, then filled up with the slumberills, leaving out eight of them. The bottle now looked exactly as it had before. Allerton would notice no difference. I went back to my room. I had a bottle of whiskey there. Most of us had at Styles. I got out two glasses and a siphon. I had never known Allerton refuse a drink yet. When he came up, I would ask him in for a nightcap. I tried the tablets and a little of the spirit. They dissolved easily enough. I tasted the mixture gingerly. A shade bitter, perhaps, but hardly noticeable. I had my plan. I should be just pouring myself out a drink when Allerton came up. I would hand that to him and pour myself out another, all quite easy and natural. He could have no idea of my feelings, unless, of course, Judith had told him. I considered this for a moment, but decided that I was quite safe here. Judith never told anyone anything. He would probably believe me to be quite unsuspicious of their plan. I had nothing to do but wait. It would be a long time, probably an hour or two, before Allerton came up to bed. He was always a late bird. I sat there quietly, waiting. A sudden knock on the door made me start. It was only Curtis, however. Poirot was asking for me. I came to myself with a shock. Poirot! I had never once thought of him all evening. He must have wondered what had become of me. It worried me a little. First of all, because I was ashamed of never having been near him, and secondly, I did not want him to suspect that anything out of the way had happened. I followed Curtis across the passage. Eh bien! exclaimed Poirot. So you desert me, eh? I forced a yawn and an apologetic smile. <laughs> Awfully sorry, old boy, I said, but to tell the truth, I've got such a 
blinding headache. I can hardly see out of my eyes. It's the thunder in the air, I suppose. I really have been feeling quite muzzy with it. In fact, so much so I entirely forgot I hadn't been in to say good night to you. As I hoped, Poirot was immediately solicitous. He offered remedies. He fussed. He accused me of having sat about in the open air in a draught on the hottest day of summer. I refused aspirin on the grounds that I had already taken some, but I was not able to avoid being given a cup of sweet and wholly disgusting chocolate. It nourishes the nerves, you comprehend? Poirot explained. I drank it to avoid argument, and then, with Poirot's anxious and affectionate exclamations still ringing in my ears, I bade him good night. I returned to my own room and shut the door, ostentatiously. Later, I opened it a crack with the utmost caution. I could not fail now to hear Allerton when he came, but it would be some time yet. I sat there waiting. I thought of my dead wife. Once, under my breath, I murmured, You understand, darling. I'm going to save her. She had left Judith in my care. I was not going to fail her. In the quiet and the stillness, I suddenly felt that Cinder's was very near to me. I felt almost as though she were in the room. And still I sat on, grimly, waiting. Chapter 13 There is something about writing down an anticlimax in cold blood that is somewhat shattering to one's self-esteem. For the truth of the matter is, you see, that I sat there waiting for Allerton, and that I fell asleep. Not so surprising, really, I suppose. I had slept very badly the night before— I had been out in the air the whole day. I was worn out with worry and the strain of nerving myself for doing what I had decided to do. On top of all that was the heavy, thundery weather, possibly even the fierce effort of concentration I was making helped. Anyway, it happened. I fell asleep there in my chair, and when I woke, birds were twittering outside, the sun was up, and there was I, cramped and uncomfortable, slipped down in my chair in my evening dress with a foul taste in the mouth and a splitting head. I was bewildered, incredulous, disgusted, and finally, immeasurably, and overwhelmingly, relieved. Who was it who wrote, The darkest day, lived till tomorrow, will have passed away, and how true it is. I saw now, clearly and sanely, how overwrought and wrong-headed I had been, melodramatic, lost to all sense of proportion. I had actually made up my mind to kill another human being. At this moment... My eyes fell on the glass of whisky in front of me. With a shudder, I got up, drew the curtains, and poured it out of the window. I must have been mad last night. I shaved, had a bath, and dressed. Then, feeling very much better, I went across to Poirot. He always woke very early, I knew. I sat down and made a clean breast of the whole thing to him. I may say it was a great relief. He shook his head gently at me. Ah, but what follies it is you contemplate! I am glad you came to confess your sins to me. But why, my dear friend, did you not come to me last night and tell me what was in your mind? I said shamefacedly. I was afraid, I suppose, that you would have tried to stop me. Assuredly, I would have stopped you. <laughs> that certainly. Do you think I want to see you hanged by the neck, all on account of a very unpleasant scoundrel called Major Allerton? I shouldn't have been caught, I said. I had taken every precaution. That is what all murderers think. You had the true mentality. But let me tell you, mon ami, you were not as clever as you thought yourself. Well, I took every precaution. I wiped my fingerprints off the bottle. Exactly. You also wiped Allerton's fingerprints off. And when he is found dead, what happens? They perform the autopsy, and it is established that he died of an overdose of slumberill. Did he take it by accident or intention? Tiens. His fingerprints are not on the bottle. But why not? Whether accident or suicide, he would have no reason to wipe them off. And then they analyze the remaining tablets and find nearly half of them have been replaced by aspirin. Well, practically everyone has aspirin tablets, I murmured weakly. Yes, but it is not everyone who has a daughter whom Allerton is pursuing with dishonorable intentions, to use an old-fashioned dramatic phrase. And you have had a quarrel with your daughter on the subject the day before. Two people, Boyd Carrington and Norton, can swear to your violent feelings against the man. No, Hastings, it would not have looked too good. Attention would immediately have been focused upon you. 
and by that time you would probably have been in such a state of fear or even remorse that some good solid inspector of police would have made up his mind quite definitely that you were the guilty party. It is quite possible even that someone may have seen you tampering with the tablets. Well, they couldn't. There was no one about. There is a balcony outside the window. Somebody might have been there, peeping in, or who knows, someone might have been looking through the keyhole. You've got keyholes on the brain, Poirot. People don't really spend their time looking through keyholes as much as you seem to think. Poirot half closed his eyes and remarked that I had always had a trusting nature. And let me tell you, very funny things happen with keys in this house. Me, I like to feel that my door is locked on the inside, even if the good Curtis is in the adjoining room. Soon after I am here, my key disappears, but entirely. I have to have another one made. Well, anyway, I said with a deep breath of relief, my mind still laden with my own troubles, it didn't come off. It's awful to think one can get worked up like that. I lowered my voice. Poirot, you don't think that because... because of that murder long ago there is a sort of infection in the air? A virus of murder, you mean? Well, it is an interesting suggestion. Houses do have an atmosphere, I said thoughtfully. This house has a bad history. Poirot nodded. Yes, there have been people here, several of them, who desire deeply that someone else should die. That is true enough. I believe it gets hold of one in some way. But now, Poirot, tell me, what am I going to do about all this? Judith and Alison, I mean. It's got to be stopped somehow. What do you think I'd better do? Do nothing, said Poirot, with emphasis. Oh, but believe me, you will do least harm by not interfering. If I were to tackle Allerton, what can you say or do? Judith is twenty-one, and her own mistress. But I feel I ought to be able— Poirot interrupted me. No, Hastings. Do not imagine that you are clever enough, forceful enough, or even cunning enough to impose your personality on either of those two people. Allerton is accustomed to dealing with angry and impotent fathers and probably enjoys it as a good joke. Judith is not the sort of creature who can be browbeaten. I would advise you, if I advise you at all, to do something very different. I would trust her, if I were you. I stared at him. Judith, said Hercule Poirot, is made of very fine stuff. I admire her very much. I said, my voice unsteady, I admire her too, but I'm afraid for her. Poirot nodded his head with sudden energy. I, too, am afraid for her, he said, but not in the way you are. I am terribly afraid, and I am powerless. Or nearly so. And the days go by. There is danger, Hastings. And it is very close. If you enjoyed this audio and the value and effort that we bring you these audiobooks of world-class authors, like Agatha Christie, then why not buy us a cup of coffee? Look for the link below in the description area. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you will not miss another audio. Thank you for supporting this channel. It is appreciated.